Welcome to the Artistic Spirit Podcast. I'm here today with Lucky Lee, comedian, speaker, author, teacher, massage, and movement therapist, and specialist. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you on today. And I have a question. I just want to jump right into it. Can you share a personal story or creative practice that not only helped you heal and overcome challenges, but also played a pivotal role in finding your authentic voice as a creative speaker, writer, comedian? Yeah. So um, I think that comedy actually has been like the most healing practice in the world for me. Um, So I have been a speaker and writer in some capacity all my life, Um, maybe a comedian in some capacity all my life too. But uh, a year and a half ago, my dad passed away from cancer. And while he was on hospice, I was assaulted by a close family member. And that was a obviously a pretty traumatic event in my life at a very vulnerable time in my life. And um, as I was journaling and processing and like unraveling all of that comedy, like watching comedy and watching comedic shows was something that really was one of the only things that helped me to like escape a little bit and in a healthy way um, to lighten up and kind of I mean, like disassociate, but in a, in a positive way, in a way that felt positively transformative. It gave me something outside of the story that I was really spiraling through and, and needed to spiral through, but, um, also needed a safe way to step away from that. And comedy was that for me. So, yeah. I love that. I think that's so beautiful. You mentioned struggling with chronic illness pain, depression, and addictive tendencies since childhood. How did these challenges shape your early life? And what were some of the turning points in your journey to overcome them? Yeah, so I mean, that's a long, that's a long amount of stuff now. Um, So I would say, I probably noticed that I had, I mean, I didn't notice at the time, but looking back, would say that I had pretty severe depression setting on at about age nine. Um, We lost a close family friend who was really young when I was eight. My parents fought a lot and I think that really impacted me. Uh, I'm a pretty creative, weird, liberal person who was kind of always into like spiritual stuff, kind of a gonzo. And I grew up in a kind of conservative community. And so I always felt very othered. Um, And then my mom passed away when I was 16 and she was like my best friend. She was a really, really incredible person and the biggest influence in my life. Uh, and so those things all really impacted me. And I think for years, I just felt crazy. Uh, I definitely had suicidal ideation and attempted suicide a couple of times. One of the most severe being when I was 19. Um, and obviously the world was or universe or whatever was like, nah, be you're, you're not out yet. You, you got more to do. But um, yeah, it was a really up and down journey as someone who presents very positive, but also has like this deep inner struggle, which I think is very human also. Um, so it was a long journey and I had chronic health issues as a child. So was tested for things like leukemia um, and different autoimmune disorders as a young kid, although I was very active and healthy overall. And obviously they never found anything. And so I was lucky enough to have a very spiritual and open and brilliant mother who did draw in like these other things aside from just the medical. and helped me to explore what else could be going on. Um, and so it's been it's been kind of a lifelong journey of uncovering the deeper root causes of things. Um, and so I was very passionate about doing that for myself and then also doing it for others. Uh, so the more I worked with other people in their chronic pain, the more I learned. And as a massage therapist, you have to do continuing education. And so I was always growing and always learning more and more about these topics um, from scientifically backed things and classes and workshops. 
So that was really impactful and profound for my own healing too, mm -hmm. to get to see it unravel and, and unfold for others and myself as well. Yeah. Can you share more about your journey as an intuitive healer and how you discovered this aspect of yourself? Um, so I actually came kind of into the planet, able to see the bioenergetic field around people. So what people call the aura. Um, and like I said, I grew up in a conservative community, thankfully had that wonderful mother who was very open-minded and open-hearted. Um, but at a certain age, I, my mom would actually like bring me to healing touch classes she went to and she's like, oh, let's have you draw everybody's aura, which at this age was like, it was cool, but I was also maybe eight or nine and like drawing for 50 year old, like doing intuitive readings on like 50, 45 year old women. And that was kind of a lot as well. You know, that was um, seeing things that I couldn't necessarily always interpret and it was a lot of like information to be downloading and then responsible for also translating and giving to people. Uh, and then a psychic one time told me, I think I was maybe nine or 10. And she was like, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to do this. Like you're not, you don't have to have this. And it gave me this, um, permission to sort of shut down that gift, which at that point felt very like, oh, cool. I can just pretend I'm like everyone else and fit in and be normal. And so I did, I kind of shut down my many years. Um, and that was okay. But I think it also really stifled a part of me. Uh, and then that came back years later, I kind of started re-honing that skill again, but I wouldn't say that's my necessarily my primary skill. Now I would say I have more just like intuitive knowledge when people um, will come to me and we do a pretty in-depth consultation. I kind of call myself more like a body detective because we really sleuth out what's going on for them on all levels. Sometimes old injuries that they've totally forgotten about from like 20 years ago will be showing up in their body and they'll go, oh yeah, I totally forgot. I broke my ankle when I was 18 and you know, they're 40 and now they have hip pain. And it's like, well, this plays into that. So, um, or like, oh yeah, I broke up with my girlfriend eight months ago and that's when my back pain started. And so I see these kinds of correlations all the time in people. Uh, so that is something that I think is where intuition mixed with a really deep breadth of knowledge also really combines. Um, and again, I, so I feel like I've kind of always had this intuitive healing ability, which I believe we all have, uh, and had just really worked to hone that for many years. What advice would you give to individuals who are on their own paths of healing and self-discovery, especially those who are dealing with chronic issues, trauma, or addiction? Yeah, I would say my uh, biggest advice <laughs> is to um, first just accept yourself. First, just like embrace that you are where you are and you're not broken. Nothing is wrong with you, even though it feels like something is broken and wrong with you because that's how chronic pain feels um, or chronic illness or mental illness. It feels like we're broken. Like there's like, we're not like everybody else. Um, but the truth is everyone is fucked up in some way. And um, these things that arise within our body or our mind are actually just information for us to tell when something within us is not in alignment. And that can be a relationship. It can be a food choice. It can be a physical addiction. Um, there are so many, there's such a plethora of things that impact our body, mind, and spirit. And so first, just accept that you are where you're at and then begin to become aware. I think journaling is, is probably one of the most profound practices that exists, right? We, mm -hmm. we have that for getting everything out and that can be its own therapy. It can also be a really beautiful way to just reflect on what's happening right now so that you have like a base reading of where you're at. Um, and sometimes that includes like recording your habits. Like, okay, I feel like this today and this is what I'm doing. This is what I ate. 
this is what I, how much I moved. And Mm -hmm. it can sound kind of tedious, but that, that way of just being honestly reflective of ourselves is really helpful. And when we write it down, we can't really hide from ourselves the same way. Cause it's very easy to just like pretend it's not happening when we are looking at it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would say that just acceptance and being really straight with yourself and journaling. I think those are some of the biggest things we can do and laugh, laugh your ass off. (laughs) What's your opinion on video journals? Um, I guess that would just be like, depending on how you process for me, a video journal would not be, um, necessarily the most honest because there's a there's a whole other piece that comes into that that's the visual bit right that's um that we're judging ourselves on a different level than when we just are putting something on paper because putting it on paper is just our thoughts it's just our emotions it's just what's coming out Mm -hmm. a video journal there's a lot more information for your brain to have to process um now that's not to say that that can't also be of great value. I've done um, like long periods of time where I would do like daily videos for people. You know, I was putting something on Facebook or putting something on YouTube and it was a consistency thing and a showing up and a, hey, let's talk, um, which had value, but that wasn't the same as me going like, oh my God, my life is a fucking mess and I'm a fucking, like, you know, it's a different level of honesty. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, there is, there's different information coming into your neurological system. Uh, but there's people who don't like to write, you know, it's crazy, but there are people who don't like to write and for them, that may be the way, or maybe just an audio recording could be good too. Yeah. Sometimes I try to go back in my journals and I can't read what I wrote. Yeah. And like, sometimes I'll be writing and I'll like, I'll know what the word is, but it'll just come out and it'll be completely different if, than what it like should look like. Yeah. And I'll think to myself, there's no way I'm ever going to guess, like even remotely what that word is. <laughs> it's like challenging. Yeah. yeah, it is. And hopefully, you know, if it wasn't meant to be a story that you're going to publish, it's, a, it's also okay. Cause it's, a lot of the time that level of journaling when you are when we're writing that messy it's just getting it out it's just the therapy of the unload right of the mm-hmm. dump so um i think that's just fine and i think it happens to all of us even when it is something we want to publish we're like hold on come on context help me out what the hell is i saying orange i wouldn't say orange right there <laughs> Yeah. So in your experience, what are some common challenges people face when trying to live their best lives with more pleasure, peace, and presence? And how do you help them overcome these challenges? Yeah, I think, um, I think a big one is, I think guilt and shame are what stop almost all of us up. Uh, I think that that is prevalent in family, society, communities. I think it's very easy for things to look like they should be a certain way, or we feel like we need to look like we are a certain way. Or, um, And I think there are different issues sometimes for men and women identifying people. Um, that's not always the case, but I do work with both populations. And I see that there are a lot of stories where women specifically feel so much like they carry so much and like they have to present like everything is fine. Everything is beautiful. I've got all my shit together. I can work and be creative and be a mom or wife or partner or whatever. Um, and feel like they're really wearing a lot of hats and like they have to be good at all of them, which is bullshit. (laughs) Mm-hmm. it's it's just not true um because we're all human and nobody's great at everything even the most wonderful among us are fucked up in some way and I think that's really healing <laughs> to remember you know like Martin Luther King and Bob Marley cheated on their wives like they're wonderful prophets wonderful human beings who changed the course of history and they weren't perfect like no one is Mm -hmm. and so important to remember yeah because we all have this like idea like I gotta be this thing it's like well eh, you know nobody 
has it all together. Even even if you're religious, I mean, people crucified Christ. Like he was he was the ultimate, and uh, half the people hated him enough to murder him. So like, I just nobody's perfect, <laughs> you know. That's that's all. Yeah, and I think a lot of the times, um, especially with social media, when you put a message out there, you can instantly get like hate from people. And I think it it drives this need to feel like we have to protect ourselves from hate and that like it stops people from even sharing their message. And I think it's so important. And I always tell people this because a lot of people like ask how I'm like so vulnerable in sharing my message. And I really think it comes down to you have to recognize that that one person you're trying to reach who can take something from your message is more important than the feeling you get from the hate or the criticism or the negativity and like focusing on like the impact is like something that has always allowed for me to be more courageous. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think that's huge. And I think it's also helpful to remember to not take it personally, because even though it feels personal, they don't hate you. They have, actually, it has nothing even to do with you. Whatever someone, some stranger on the internet is projecting some shit at you, that is all about them. Like, what a what a non-busy life they must have to be going through the internet to see you out there doing your thing, trying to help people and bring some truth to the world and beauty and kindness and just be honest. And they're like, I'm going to tear down this person today because this is how much time I have on my hands. Like, what a sad existence. I know. And then the thing is, it starts conditioning me because every time I write content, I think about it actually has made me a better writer. And um, I would say even speaker, just the kind of like the constant feedback. If you choose the wrong word, if you say it in the wrong way, um, like when I do videos, uh, that's like the hate. You can kind of like anticipate it. And it's gotten to the point that sometimes when I'm writing, I'll be like, oh, someone would perceive it as this or someone would perceive it as that. And just kind of like, I'm so glad you talk about how no one's perfect in that. It's not something we should be striving for because I think even internally, like that narrative that we can change the way people perceive perceive us is something that's like still running like it's like for me when I'm editing which I mean is important like I have to have like coherent sentences to it (laughs) but um a lot of it is just like social conditioning well yeah and that's beautiful point because coherent sentences are much different than altering your authentic voice to make other people more comfortable Mm because that doesn't really serve like I always like to look at it this way Just like you said, that one person that you might be helping with your message, I also like to look at it as that one person you might be triggering with your message, you're also serving them. Mm -hmm. Like, if it's coming out in a way that's authentic and real and honest for you in that moment, instead of being like, well, this might hurt somebody's feelings, guess what? People are going to have their fucking feelings hurt no matter what. In this world, very much now, people are hurt and upset and offended by freaking everything. And Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean like just go out there and be a, you know, uncaring asshole, but also don't tailor everything you say in concern that someone might be offended because what you're going to be silent. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, that's the the truth. A lot of people (laughs) come to me and say that they're too afraid to put themselves out there because of of how people would judge them of getting hate and yeah um like it is a reality and I like you you say something that's just so valuable is that when you trigger people you're still giving them something and it's something of value and even when I get hate comments like I do kind of like ask myself like is there any validity to this and like sometimes there is and I take it as constructive criticism and other times there's not really much but it reminds me of like the importance of like why I keep speaking out like whether it's someone who's like oh you shouldn't be talking about this or someone like victim blaming and it reminds me that there are people who are going through or have been through the same things I'm going through or have been through and that they're silenced by these people and that it's so important to show them a different narrative whether it be um, like misguided social narratives or um, like temporary public figures who say sound bites that are offensive to everyone. Yeah. Um, just that, like, and the idea that um, 
that even you can take something from the hate when you put your message out there because it's so important to you that it just drives more of your purpose. Yeah, for sure. And people are like, that's another thing that I think acceptance comes in is people are going to hate you and judge you no matter what, no Mm -hmm. matter what. And it's really lovely that you can go through and like, look at hate messages and still take them constructive. I would say (laughs) fuck them right back, but good for you. I think that constructive information doesn't come forth as hate. If, if it's coming forth as hate, I I don't think there's much constructive there personally, but, but that's okay. That's just where I'm at with my own boundaries where I'm like, I mean, if you want to throw that, but if you have something to say, like, ouch, what you said was, was harmful in this way to me, if there is real information I can take from that and become better or more aware, yes, absolutely. But if it's someone just trying to tear me down to tear me down, that's a nice space for me. I so agree with that. And I, th- I thank you so much for saying this because in my perspective, like, I think like hate and criticism are two very different things. And, um, yeah. I, I don't see hate and criticism as the same, but I do think that hate can show me where I'm being silenced. Mm. And I think that's so powerful because so much of my own conditioning, because I was um, sexually assaulted when I was in college and I was like silent about it for so long. And um, a lot of my mental health struggles came from that and the silence that was building up in me. And I like always remember, like sometimes when someone sends me hate, like I, I recognize that it's because whether I have a post, I didn't put this part in that I really feel. And, you know, it like reminds me sometimes that like, I am silencing myself and sometimes I am censoring myself and it, it kind of brings out and shows me the blind spots. And again, it could be hate, but like at the same time, like, I think you almost, you almost stop being impacted by it. Like I stop having it be a narrative about myself and it's more about like this narrative of my own conditioning and like, kind of like when someone says something that is like um, victim blaming, I think to myself, like, okay, like what part of like, of me saying this, Like, could I like make clear about like the impact of victim blaming so that, so that I can like not silence myself. And even just like the idea that in that I wasn't coming from a place where I was kind of like standing in my power and like talking about like kind of like advocating for um, survivors was something that was like really eye opening to me. And it's like, not that I'm taking it and like, putting it in my heart and being like, oh yeah, this person's right. But I'm taking it and saying, I'm silencing myself because of because of this social narrative. And like, sometimes I don't even think so much about the person, but I think, well, I have empathy for them because I think it's, they must be in s- severe pain to be hating on people. It's, I don't know why you've just not scroll past, um, but that they're like kind of like a representation of the social narrative that was the kind of like what made me sick for so long yeah yeah that makes sense you're so you're seeing the same social narrative being played out on social media the same one that kept you silenced from like coming forth about abuse Mm -hmm. that yeah yeah I mean that totally makes sense absolutely well that's a beautiful way that you're using it for your own personal growth and your way to learn to like stand in your power and remembering to put all the pieces of the story there instead of holding back it it's what it sounds like right it sounds like you're saying oh I was missing a part of the story that I was afraid to share but if that was in there this would have been presented differently anyways Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's a great reflection it sounds like yeah and just like that part where it's like sometimes we don't even notice like what we don't see yet and even like um that there's no destination for healing like it's always happening and just that like I'm never gonna have like um like the perfect speech or the perfect pose because like everything could always be added because you're always flowing and you're always healing and that like kind of like in terms of like seeing what you put out there as art like it's like it's his own masterpiece in like the moment that it is and like how it chronicles like a a time of your life that like, again, is just a moment. 
Yeah, I love that. It's very zen, right? It's like <laughs> you create it and then it's destroyed and it's on to the next. It's just the next, the next, the next. And yeah, this moment, now this moment, now this moment. I love that very much. Mm-hmm. So I have a bit of a deeper question, but I think this will help a lot of people. So mm-hmm. how did these ex- this experience of loss and grieving of your parents affect your perspective on life and your path towards healing and self-discovery? Yeah, I mean, um, again, I think that because I came in intuitive with a mom who really held space for that, um, I was just naturally going to be on this trajectory of like self-inquiry anyways. I was born creative and like born around theology and um, so always kind of exploring that. But then, yeah, losing my mom was huge. That was, Mm -hmm. I mean, I was 16 Uh, So it was like a major pivotal time of my life anyways. Uh, I think that her interests are what drove me to the work I was doing, Mm -hmm. which is interesting because now at this point in my life, I'm actually like, oh, I really did that to like connect with my mom because I missed her and like wanted to carry forth her gifts too. Um, And now I'm at a point where I'm like, oh yeah, but there's this girl who was inside of me who is who my mom was fostering me to be just like an entertainer. Like I was a creative Mm -hmm. entertainer, a writer, a performer. And that's what I always loved and wanted to be before my mom passed. And so it's interesting that when my dad passed, I felt able to step back into like my lifelong dreams. Um, But I really loved that healing career that I was able to follow and pursue and get really amazing at because of my love for my mom. Um, And also my mom dying young made me pack it in like life. I was like, life is short. Time is precious. I'm going to do everything and everyone I can do in this lifetime while I can. Cause like, to me, it just wasn't guaranteed because it's not. Mm -hmm. Um, And so in some ways that was really awesome. And in some ways it was really unhealthy and I can see that now, but I'm also like, I don't regret a second of it. So um, when I graduated from high school, it made me move across the country to like go to school far away in another state where I wanted to. So I moved solo at 18 across the country. Um, I traveled and backpacked around Europe and went to an advanced hair school there. I like did everything, took every risk where a lot of people are like risk averse. I don't have that at all. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know that I necessarily had a ton of it to begin with, but I think my mom passing very much pushed me to be like, oh, you, you want to do it. You better do it now. Cause you never know. And so, yeah, like skydived and cliff dived and have have done all the things, have done all the things because of that. Um, And so that was like a really beautiful gift to live very fully. I think that was the gift that came with my mom's death was to live very fully, to be very loving and open and honest. And if I had a thought or desire to go with it and do it. And then with my dad's death, my dad was very um, opposite my mom. He was very like responsible type A, a teacher, a coach, very grounded, um, financially supportive, but like very indifferent to who I was. And uh, so there was a big wound there for feeling like I was never seen. And they say that in the opposite of love is not hate, but is indifference. And so I know my dad like loved me the best he could in his way, but I always was like very hungry for that because I never felt seen. And, um, I think what happened with the coupling of my dad's passing and this close family friend attacking me helped me to find my voice again and come back into standing in my power Mm -hmm. because I, as a healer, it's very common or an empath is another word that we hear a lot, right? Is 
to give and give and give. And it really is more codependence oftentimes. And that was very true for me was like, I wanted to just heal the world. I wanted to heal the world. I wanted to fix everybody, help everybody give and support and love everyone the best I could. And how can I help? And I drained myself too. And I still, my dad never saw me no matter what, you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, Mm -hmm. he, again, we healed in many ways and like he did his best, but there's no way to get the love we're missing from our parents because they're also human. We're human. Everybody, even the best parent in the world fucks up and we all need therapy or, or friends are journaling. <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that was this beautiful gift that came from this really horrific experience of my dad's passing and this person hurting me was I was able to be like, oh, I don't, I am not responsible for anybody but me. And that was huge. So, yeah. You mentioned that your life is dedicated to helping others remember the truth of who they are. Can you explain your approach to this and the methods or practices you use to guide people on this journey? Yeah. So again, we talked about how I filled out this questionnaire kind of (laughs) quite a while ago. And um, so that's still true, but the way and the process has very much shifted. Um, for years I worked one-on-one with people and, and in small group classes or festivals or whatever. And so it was very much my goal to just like tap into what people are hiding from themselves Mm -hmm. and help them. Like I said, body detective, we sleuth out all these stories. We would like hunt out the childhood trauma and rip it up and uncover Mm -hmm. it and give them the space to be in the mud, right. To sit with the discomfort and the stories and to give them permission to feel it and to see it. And again, acceptance, right. It's okay. Um, so that was a lot of the work and just like accepting people as they are and loving them and, and then giving them tools to work through that. And those are sometimes meditations or breath work or movement practices. So there was a big array of these healing practices. Um, but again, as I've stepped more into my, like, I just want to write and perform, I still Mm -hmm. have a practice of people I work with like that. Um, but the more I step into this other role that really feels like the true role I came to like live in this lifetime or whatever, at least at this point, it's more about just being me. So like helping others to be their best self. I think that's actually something I have a little, a bit of a qualm about sometimes right now, as I, as we hear like be your authentic self and things thrown around a lot, which is beautiful and necessary. And yes, And also um, through experience working with coaches and teachers and things, you can't teach anyone to be their authentic self. You can give them permission by being you, by being your authentic self, and you can hold space and accept them as who they are in this moment. But yeah, that's kind of it. Yeah. When I talk about authenticity, I actually, um, like I define it in like my own practice as showing up as you're worthy. So like, like you're not holding anything back. You don't feel, you don't feel like you have to be someone else in order to step into a room, to step into, um, a new situation. You just have to be yourself. And the idea that like, as you show up as that, like you are worthy, like without question. Um, and like, kind of like when I was thinking about that, because for a while, uh, a lot of topics kept coming up when I was creating my online course, a bunch of like, I was doing interviews and people kept saying about like authenticity, authenticity. And it was something in my head that just wasn't that definitive. And a lot of people would tell me, oh yeah, like I really see like your authenticity in your content. And I would just kind of like think about like, what exactly does that mean? Or like, how do you create it? And like, um, people would ask me about it and I didn't really have much of an answer until I kind of like looked back to like how I found my own voice and like I recognized that it was like just the belief that like 
no matter how I showed up, I was worthy. And the secondary belief when you put yourself out there is that no matter what anyone says, I'm still worthy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's what it is, right? That you're worthy no matter what. And it's it's just real, right? That's all authenticity is just being the real you in this moment. And so, yeah, you're doing that. What a beautiful compliment to hear from people that they just saw that in you, that you were just totally genuine. That's lovely. Yeah. Um. So in terms of creativity and healing in your life and work, um, what has been your biggest influence? And would you say that other than like the passing of your father, did you have anything happen that was like, transformative in like your new shift um of how you express your creativity from the like actual like practice like of intuitive healing to like the more of the entertainment side yeah so I think it was the shift in in my like power and belief in myself I think that was a huge thing that really helped drop the like almost lifelong depression sort of fell away when my dad passed when when this person hurt me that I sort of was like oh holy crap this thing I've held all my life of thinking I'm not worthy right Mm -hmm. thinking I Mm -hmm. don't deserve to be seen or loved or whatever um or could never be good enough that all fell away when I was like oh, actually, it doesn't matter what anyone thinks. We're all already, we're like, you know, the Mm -hmm. stuff that we know, but I embodied it finally to be like, oh, yeah, I'm good. It doesn't, nothing matters. I'm good. Like, I like myself. (laughs) Um, And so I think that was the transformation. And also it was hideous. Like it wasn't like, boom, it was like months of like crying on the floor and ugly sobbing and journaling and, mm-hmm. you know, cutting ties with people and reevaluating lots of relationships. And like, there were, it was a long, ugly process. It wasn't a pretty instant shift. Um, that's what happens when you burn your life down. Right. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was a shifting And then as I was saying yes to stepping up more to like public speaking, I found a a book by uh, David Nahill, who is, he worked in corporate for years. He's a Irish comedian now, and he wrote a book called Do You Talk Funny? And it's just about how public speakers can incorporate some humor to make their speeches more impactful and their content more memorable. And it wormholed me into more stand-up comedy and incorporating more humor, like intentionally into my speaking and writing. And then I was just like off to the races and sort of like started writing comedy and and was like, oh yeah, I should be up at open mics practicing more because, you know, if you're not getting speaking gigs, you still want to be speaking. And so that's sort of what I started doing. And I was like, oh my gosh. And as I started telling people who've known me forever, who really love me and like see me that I was doing this, everyone was like, yes, what? Yes. Like, they're like, this is what, are you kidding? I can't believe me. Nobody saw it before. Like, so I kind of say it's like the boyfriend in a rom-com who's like the best friend the whole time. And she never sees that he's like the one. And I'm like, oh, that's comedy. Like it's been here all along. I was Mm -hmm. a funny hairstylist and a funny body worker and a goofy public speaker. And now I'm like, oh, it's because I was meant to be doing this. So um, yeah, so it just felt like it very much fell into place. And so since starting consciously doing stand up and and comedy writing um in like june i have probably filled four or five notebooks with like bits and and sets and all of that so i mean it's it comes out of me on a very regular basis uh so uh, i don't know if that answered that question <laughs> yeah so it sounds like um the transformation and the pivot was very healing like a healing experience and not only just that but maybe like freeing in a way that lets you embody who you are um so I would say 
I think because that probably will be like inspirational to some of the people listening. Um, like what does that process actually feel like in your body? Um, because you're an intuitive healer. So I'm sure you are aware of this. Um, but just like, how does it feel? And like, what does it take for someone to actually like do that in their own life? Well, I think um, it's hard to guide someone to that because again, I've been utilizing yoga and meditation and deep healing practices and weird esoteric shit all my life. And you can't force a transformation. Mm -hmm. I think that that is good to know. Um, I didn't want my dad to die. I didn't want to be assaulted. Uh, Mm -hmm. I didn't even know I wanted to do stand-up comedy. So like, there was no thing in me going like, it's time for transformation. You know, it was, it was a lifetime of going up and down through the shit that is life of love and grief and loss and, you know, business and all of that motherhood. Um, but it was an external catalyst that brought forth a deep internal change. And what it feels like in my body is that um, shit that felt heavy all my life is no longer there. You know, there's no, there's no weight on me telling me like, you should probably kill yourself. (laughs) Like, I'm not saying there aren't still every now and then moments, but like, that was a pretty regular thing for me to be Mm -hmm. experiencing. Or when things went wrong, I did not think I knew how to problem solve or, um, deal with life's challenges or anything like that. And sometimes I still feel those things like, oh my gosh, this is too much, or this is overwhelming, Mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily feel the need to check out anymore. I feel like it's cool. It's all going to work out. You know, like even if I'm homeless on the street, I'll be cool. Like I'll be happy. I'll be me and things work out and we all die. So like, that's to me that it's, it's helpful to remember these things that we all try to push away. Like people want to live forever or they want to do all the health things to try to be the best version of themselves. Sometimes it's like, just be the version of yourself that you are. Mm -hmm. You're, you're good. You're doing your best. And when you need to make a change, you make a conscious choice and do something to change your habits. You do it when it's time. Yeah. I would say I definitely disagree with you in that your transformation it was like the traumatic catalyst because I think anyone can go through similar things but it's a choice to be courageous and for you to do something that really like brought up so much for you and like brought up like another um like spiritual people would say another timeline um I think it's like so beautiful and I don't know the making the choice to be more free I think is always courageous like because there's fear with it and kind of like even this idea of like what silence does silences us like also those things that hold us back and the comfort of not changes changing is always there so I would just say I really think that um you chose courage and it made a big difference Thank you. And that, yes, I think you're correct in that. And I, and that is one thing that, yes, we can always do. Yes. To when you know that you're in a space you can no longer be in, when you want a change, when you want a transformation, yes, you do have to be courageous and honest with yourself. Um, And then, yeah, go for it. And that, that is what creates it. And it is, it is hard and ugly and painful too. I think that, I think that's always good to know ahead of time because it's not like an easy journey. Um, That's why they call it the hero's journey. Right. But Mm -hmm. I guess it's, I guess for me, it's hard because these are, there were things that were thrown at me all my life that kept putting me on this path. But like I said, I also did go toward, I always went towards it. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't foreign to me. Um, But yeah, there. Yeah. I, I hope everyone finds their way to where they want to be. You know, I hope. Yeah. If you can kind of like offer one takeaway from someone who's kind of listening to this and, or watching it and asking themselves, how can I get to that place that I want to be where I feel more free, where a lot of this heaviness um, becomes lighter. And um, I feel like I'm 
authentic and I have found my voice um like what, what what's like one takeaway you would say for that person listening I would say accept yourself and that you're already free you, you're already free freedom is it's your you have that ability already um and yes go courageously go courageously lead with your heart and and love yourself, you know, but in the way that it's about really doing that, like accepting yourself, it doesn't mean you always have to like yourself to love yourself. If you can define, um, what acceptance, either what it looks like, or, um, like kind of like a process for it, or just, um, like even it, like how it would feel in the body. Like, um, could you? Yeah, acceptance feels that? like peace. Acceptance feels oh, like beautiful. peace in your body. I mean, acceptance is like if you're shaming yourself for all of your behaviors, thoughts, actions, deeds, everything that feels heavy, that mm-hmm. feels secretive, that feels shameful. That is not truth. Acceptance is going. I'm doing this. I'm doing this thing that I shouldn't be doing, or I should be doing that. You drop the shoulds, which is just becoming aware of them first before you can accept them. You have to see that you're doing that to yourself. And then you go, oh, I'm doing this thing. I'm drinking too much. I'm eating shit. I'm being lazy. I'm Netflixing. I'm scrolling. I'm smoking, whatever. I said something mean. I yelled at my kid. And instead of going, I'm a bad person for doing that, you go, Mm -hmm. I'm a person. (laughs) And I did that or I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's acceptance. And then you have the freedom to make a different choice or the same one. It doesn't always have to, you can make a different choice and you can make the same choice and you can still accept either one, but that's an empowered place. And that feels like strength in your body. And it feels like peace in your body Mm -hmm. to be accepting of yourself and where you're at and laugh your ass off. (laughs) <laughs> well thank you for coming on today oh my gosh thank you for having me Katie that was such a pleasure it was really wonderful